All right. Awesome. Drink it, Phil. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. This is this has been great. I don't know how I'm going to follow those those talks with uh, I'm trying to I think of how I can put some conspiracy or some intelligence stuff into my presentation. But my presentation is on circuit breakers. It's a design pattern often used with microservices. Uh, is any is anyone here familiar with that? Uh, has anyone used it? Cool, cool, this is great. So you'll learn today the basics of circuit breaking. Um, I've been hearing this term a lot more lately. I think it's because of our industry's move uh, towards microservices uh, personally. So microservices are everywhere. You might have heard a lot uh, in other talks. Uh, if you work at a technology company, you might be breaking out your monolith like we are at Ibotta into separate services. We're taking um, uh, business concerns that were tightly integrated into a giant code base uh, when we're ripping them out putting them in the, into services that are encapsulated and worked on by smaller teams that can work agilely uh, they're not constrained by monolith deployment schedules or giant uh, tightly coupled code bases or databases um, we're decoupling and decentralizing data we're taking out um, tables from these giant relational databases that are tightly coupled and putting them into faster smaller databases that are centered around a specific business concern and they're gated by and guarded by microservices um, this, is, this allows us to scale faster, develop faster, uh, avoid a lot of uh, the locking that comes with uh, monolithic databases. Uh, but, despite, but the problem is that there's a price, right? So with microservices, instead of being able to say, get all your customer data with one database transaction in one local process, now you have to go and make 10 different calls to 10 different microservices. There's a, there's a network, network layer there that's, that causes some lag. Uh, but that's not acceptable to have slower services. We still need to have fast service, and we still want result reliable service. Um, how do we do that when you have microservices uh, adding a lot of complexity, a lot more moving parts? Um, and here's my friend Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Uh, any Game of Thrones fans out here? Um, here he gives you a little advice. I play a little game. I assume the worst. Uh, he's a trickster. He's a conniving guy. Uh, he's trying to take over Westeros, uh, get the, the crown for himself. But this advice could also be used for microservice design. Uh, when, you, when you design a microservice, it's, it's gonna fail at some point. You have to design for it. Imagine what'll happen. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, you want it to fail fast when it does fail. You want it to fail gracefully. And you want to avoid cascading failures, meaning you have a microservice that serves a specific purpose. You, if that goes bad, if something goes wrong, you don't want that to hold up your entire app and crash your entire app because one small microservice went down. And if you don't design for it, it's very easy for that to happen. Um, here's a real world example. How can, I, how can I have a circuit breaker help with that, that problem? Uh, circuit breaker, if you look in your kitchen or your basement, wherever your circuit breaker is located, you'll see a bunch of switches. You'll see, um, you'll see that uh, all the switches are labeled for a specific room or a specific area of the house. And, and what do they do? They trip when there's an overloaded or short circuit, cutting off current to the problem line until the issue can be safely addressed. Uh, we've got our friend Garfield here demonstrating for us in picture form more, more eloquently than I could uh, verbally. Um, he's plugging in, and then he's overloading the circuit, and then bam. In the comic, the, the whole neighborhood power grid goes out, but in the, turn, in the context of microservices, you would actually have just um, the localized service being uh, circumvented, and you could use the rest of the house uh, without fear of burning it down, just that one room would get cut off. So uh, getting away from cartoon cats uh, to sort of UML-like diagrams, um, uh, when you give a talk on microservices or uh, design patterns, Martin Fowler is the guy that you uh, quote. Right, it's kind of like Webster's Dictionary for this stuff. Um, a microservice that's wrapped in a circuit breaker, uh, that's, a, that's a function call, um, and there's an object called the circuit breaker which monitors for failures. In this example, you see a caller, uh, maybe that's our monolith. And let's say, uh, just for the sake of example, that this is a bookstore ap application. You're, you're, you're letting your customers buy books. Uh, but your microservice that you ripped out of the monolith is now a specific service that only returns recommended books for a customer. So uh, for, for a specific customer, you know their browsing habits, you know their profile, uh, there's a database that has their specific books that you think that they will like. Um, this is the, the green state where the circuit's closed, everything is going well, but we're monitoring for failures. Uh, once the failures reach a certain threshold, whatever you can figure, say like three failures in a row, the circuit breaker trips to an open state. Uh, I'm not an electrician <laughs> or very handy around the house, so I, I often get mixed up between open and closed. I, I always think open is good, closed is bad. But no, open is actually bad. That's when the circuit is open uh, and it's not, it's not conducting current to the service. Closed is good, right? The closed is when current can flow properly. Um, in this state, there's a fallback data being uh, returned instead of the regular data from the back end, uh, which you'd normally get. In this state, we're not even going to that back end. The circuit breaker is like, okay, we're gonna give them a break and we're just gonna fail fast, fail gracefully, give them some fallback data. 
Um, in this particular example, for a, for a bookstore, can anyone think of good fallback data we could return to the user to, to give them a good experience? You can't give them personalized recommendations. Is there anything else you could maybe give them? What's that? That's exactly it. You give them some uh, just global, globally best-selling books that maybe they'll like. They probably won't even notice that uh, the service is down. And the, the important part is that you can let them continue browsing the site and buying stuff. Um, if it's an MVP, you don't have time to, to return bestsellers, just return nothing, right? Uh, for, depending on the, the microservice, you might just be able to return nothing. Uh, they might see that, oh, it looks like a part of this site is down, or uh, it looks like I don't have all the information I need, but I can still keep on browsing the site and, and using the app. Uh, so yeah, when further calls to the circuit breaker return with an error, uh, the protected call is not being made at all. It keeps on failing. Uh, over here, you see that we're giving the protected service a break. Maybe it's uh, in an error state. Maybe it's overloaded. Maybe that's why it failed. You want to give it some time to recover before you even try again. This period of time is called the cool down period. Um, when the circuit's in an open state, the circuit breaker uses a timer to manage this. So let's say the cool down period you configured is 60 seconds. During this time, the circuit remains open. All calls to the service continue to fail fast. Uh, and it's, at this point, we're still giving that the, the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, the customers are still happy. They don't realize that something's gone catastrophically, long, catastrophically wrong with your service. Uh, once the cool down period is reached, uh, 60 seconds, the, the circuit breaker enters the half open state, which is this yellow box right here. And what's this state? Half open, the circuit breaker starts letting through a limited number of requests. In this, uh, example right here, we're going to let through one request and see if it, it succeeds going to the service. Uh, this state's a trial period. If the request succeeds, then hey, uh, we figure the problem's been solved. We switch back to a closed state and we start the whole cycle over again. If the request fails, the, we can assume that the problem still is, is a problem. The database is still down. Uh, the bug still needs to be fixed. So uh, we again go into the open state for another 60 seconds before we even try again. So that was a lot. I'm going pretty fast because we only got 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm just going to, just to hammer the, the point home, and for those who learn better with cartoon cats than UML diagrams, uh, just we're going to quickly run through a play-by-play -play with Garfield here. He's trying to plug in the Christmas lights. Um, this is when the beginning state, the closed state, where the circuit's open, everything's good, but we're monitoring for errors. Plugs it in, bam, something goes wrong. Uh, in, in our microservice, probably you'd want to configure something to go wrong like three or four or five times in a row before you actually break the circuit. Um, things that you can configure, uh, examples, like what if uh, you get three consecutive HTTP, HTTP timeouts in a row? That could be a good signal to break the circuit. Uh, say you don't want to wait for a whole HTTP timeout. You can just uh, say, hey, I want this to fail fast. If it's taking longer than two seconds, just, uh, just send the fallback. And each, each long response can add a vote towards breaking the circuit. Uh, 500 internal server errors, badly formed responses. If you can't parse the response, if uh, you're missing required fields in the response, those could all be things that uh, count towards breaking the circuit. And now it's all dark in the neighborhood. Uh, Garfield's in the dark. This is our cool down period. This is the point at which no matter how many times he plugs it in, all requests are going to fail. Fallback is returned. Uh, you hopefully you have monitoring and alerting going on. Uh, you should have a dashboard that shows when the circuit goes down. We have um, and I bought a, a Datadog alert or monitor set up for a circuit breaker, so we'll see something in Slack in an alerts channel, so we can go investigate if something's wrong. And here's uh, Garfield. Uh, all of a sudden, he can start trying again, because 60 seconds have passed. Uh, if he uh, shorts it again when he tries, you go back to the open state and it gets dark. If he doesn't, if it doesn't blow up, then good, good deal. Trial request is, was successful. John's happy. Garfield's happy. Circuit screen. Uh, the circuit breaker has done its job. Um, here we are. <laughs> am I an artist? Yes, I am. This is, <laughs> I'll take credit for this. <laughs> Hopefully I won't get sued. I don't think Jim Davis hangs out in these circles. Um, and by the way, uh, everyone usually does Dilbert cartoons for this. I found Garfield is actually the way to go. There's so many Garfield cartoons. Any subject you look up, like I look up circuit breaker, Garfield, there's like 30 cartoons. I look cache and validation, Garfield, there's like 50 cartoons. I'm just kidding. Not, not cache and validation. But um, <laughs> with, um, when you want to implement a circuit breaker, you can roll your own. Um, but that's not, a, that's not advised when there's so many good open source projects out there. Uh, I work mostly on the Ruby on Rails part of Ibotta's infrastructure. Um, I introduced a stoplight uh, library that does circuit breaking. It's simple, it's fast, it's efficient. It uses Redis as a back end to store uh, circuit states. Um, there's also, if you're in the Ruby and Rails community, uh, Shopify Semyon. Shopify does a lot of Ruby and Rails uh, open source projects. They're a great boon to the community. Uh, if you're a Java developer, uh, you might have heard of Netflix's Hystrix. 
And that's a really good uh, complete solution that not only does circuit breaking, a lot of related design uh, patterns like uh, bulkhead, uh, timeout, retries, uh, it's the whole package. Uh, I put Resilience 4J under there because I've actually read recently that Netflix is moving away from their own Hystrix towards this uh, library called Resilience 4J. It's less well known, but you might hear more of it in the future. Um, I only put two languages here. Obviously, there's more languages. Uh, quick Google search for whatever your language of choice is will probably turn up a good uh, implementation for you. Uh, this is the obligatory we're hiring slide. Uh, I work at Ibotta. We are the most downloaded app in Colorado. Uh, it's a really fun place to work. A lot of really smart engineers there, probably some of the smartest engineers I've worked with, besides me, of course. Um, <laughs> if you're interested in a career there, we're looking for engineers. Uh, talk to me in person. You can uh, tweet at me, I guess. You can email me or look at our website. And let's see, that's it. Oh, I had one slide in between. There's Sam Wall from Game of Thrones. Uh, he's just doing what he loves best, reading in the library. Uh, if you download this uh, presentation, now I'm gonna make it available later, um, you can click on these links and read further about different kinds of circuit breakers, including ones I haven't talked about here. And that is it. Hopefully that wasn't within 20, 10 minutes. I drank a ton of coffee, so that's great. I was going fast. <laughs> um, yeah, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any feedback? Was I going too fast? I was trying to get it within 10 minutes, but. Uh... <laughs> thanks, thanks. So yes. Sure. Sure. Um, that could take another hour, uh, but I'll give you the overview. <laughs> when we started off, uh, before I, I joined the company two years ago, it was basically a monolithic uh, application. In other words, there's one code base that did everything. It did all the, the service busing. It did all the, the database uh, CRUD operations. It served out the, the API controllers to the mobile apps. Um, it ran like asynchronous workers. It was all in one code base. Uh, and to a large extent, we're still there because it's if anyone's if anyone's tried to take a monolith and break it apart, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, everything is hosted on Amazon's AWS infrastructure. Um, in the last couple of years, we've been trying to break out parts of that um, because there's, there's basically a bottleneck where we have this database that's a relational database that contains all our data. And um, when you want to do any kind of changes to it, it's a huge migration that can take hours or days. Um, and the, 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 the business logic is so tightly coupled in there, it's hard to work on something without affecting someone else uh, in an, on another team. So uh, we've been trying to take stuff out and put them into different services. And we have a lot of different skill sets that I bought. There's some Java programmers, there's Ruby programmers, there's Python programmers. Um, so one good thing about microservices is you can just take a piece of business logic, encapsulate it in whatever your team's most comfortable working with, and have a service that's just deployed for that. Um, have its own data store, so you're not locking up tables with some monolithic database. Um, they can continue working fast. They can do like 10 deployments a day if they want to without having to wait for them monolith to deploy. Um, but it's all on AWS. We've been moving from using Elastic Beanstalk uh, as a load balancer to uh, an EC2 instances, and we've been moving more towards Kubernetes, which is a containerized uh, platform for uh, deploying stuff uh, basically on virtual machines. Um, so that was a lot. Uh, that was just the overview, but hopefully I, hopefully I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, you were first. Have you ever run into any dynamic interactions where Normal operation of one circuit breaker causes a cascading of others. Mm. How do you think about that kind of thing? It, it would be a deadline. How, how can you monitor and orchestrate multiple circuit breakers so that they won't interact badly? That's a good question. So when you design your circuit breaker, they're not all they're not all as nice and neat like the example of the bookstore. Um, but basically, you do want to think of the worst things that can happen and say, hey, if I return this fake data or if I return nothing, is it going to actually cause a huge problem? Like, so maybe I'm not holding up the connections because I've circuit broken it. So I'm not holding out to these connections. So now I'm not coming up the system that way. But I'm returning this bad data or this fake data back to the, to the thing that's calling it. What if it needed that data to do something really important synchronously with the next step in its workflow? Um, and that's something you have to think through. And in cases like that, um, you might have to, to combine circuit breaker pattern with other design patterns that, that can solve for it, have high availability, failover, secondary data stores, uh, use locally cached stuff. There's a, there's a fascinating blog by Netflix on how they uh, had to use Hystrix once as a case study when a service went down, a pretty important service. And they showed through a bunch of graphs and um, a detailed explanation of each step of the way what their circuit breaker did and how it solved for it, giving 
locally cached data. So it didn't have like fake data like a New York Times bestseller, but they had a somehow locally cached sort of stale data for each user and they returned that and that seemed to work and most users didn't even notice that the site was down or that service was down. Um, so that's like a really broad answer to your question, but that's a great question to bring up because sometimes the, when you have a complex system of, of small microservices interacting, there's, the complexity is multiplied with every microservice. And so a lot of things can go wrong that you're not even thinking of. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, um, you mentioned the last site, I don't know mm -hmm. that, but um, is it between the last site and the last search and um, some of the more uh, management things? Is that used for managing responses from uh, microservices? Um, yeah, so Elastic Beanstalk is kind of the load balancer that, uh, that you can use in AWS's infrastructure with their EC2 instances. So these are, um, when I, you know, a few years ago, if you had an AWS infrastructure for your services, you basically uh, spun up EC2 instances and you had them um, load balanced uh, so that all requests came through an Elastic Beanstalk load balancer. And the, the ELB can, can spin up more copies and, and scale um, as you need it. If it saw a lot of traffic and, and you set it up to scale, it could just spin up more instances to serve on the back end and run.